Dear loving Father, which are in heaven, <clears throat> dear Lord, we are grateful, Lord, to be alive in these closing moments of earth history. And Lord, to witness what our forefathers would have loved to be able to see. To be in a time, Lord, when we can hasten your soon coming. And Lord, we are the only avenue that can do that. Neither the world powers, not in mighty force of this world. But Lord, it's only through the simplicity of your people that can bring you back. Bless us, Lord, to this end. In Christ's name, amen. amen. We are more than thankful to be in your midst today. Let's see here. I don't have, can we get this for me? Anyway, I'm more than happy to be here. Uh, my name is Maimon Wilson, and just a little brief introduction. I've been a medical missionary physician for almost 50 years. Uh, God called me in this work many years ago to take on the most difficult cases in the world. Uh, I have done some things that <clears throat> amaze me. I'm an herbal surgeon. I've performed hundreds of surgeries. I've taken tumors out of people, bodies bigger than your head. And I don't cut them with a knife. I use herbs and minerals to extract the tumors. I was opposed to herbal chemo, I mean chemo. But at the same time, I knew that chemo had a positive effect on the mastosis of cells. I wanted to see how I could develop chemo without the adverse side effects. And so I made chemo out of herbs. I call it herbal chemo. <laughs> and it troubled me with radiation, the cytotoxic effect of radiation. And I began to study how to build my own radiation machine. And I developed an apparatus we call Herboray that have no adverse side effects. It's been a wonderful journey to study the plants and the herbs. I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. I had no formal knowledge of Christianity. I was just a young black boy born on the other side of the track. But the things that God has allowed me to do have enhanced and increased my faith. It's been a wonderful journey. And today, God gave me the icing on the cake. My dear brother Bob, I thought he was dead. I did. People told me he was dead. I said, wow. I didn't get a chance to see Bob before he died. <laughs> <laughs> it was like resurrection morning when I seen him today. I got a taste of that. You know how you think somebody's gone, then all of a sudden they're back. Good to see you, Bob. It really is. We, got, we live together. We spend many, many days together. You got a good husband. I know that. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, what I want to talk about this morning is the miracle of the ages, the steps of Christ. And uh, we're going to take a journey with Christ, the work of the withered right hand. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, and the recovering of the sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable years of the Lord. That has been my calling. I had a calling that I had for myself. God had a calling for me. I want to be Michelangelo da Vinci and Picasso. I want to be the greatest artist in the world. And that was my ambition, that was my drive, that was my motivation. I want to go to university. I want to be a master artist. And it encapsulated my whole energy, my thought, and my life. Nothing else super perceived being an artist. Everything about me was to be an artist. It crowded out everything in my life. 
and I went to bed with it I got up with it I was never an alcoholic I never took dope because I thought it messed my brain up but I was drunk on being an artist it was just as deadly and God introduced a little book called Minister Healing to me a little girl gave me this book and that book transformed my life I found out that Jesus was more than a preacher. He was a doctor and a preacher. If anything, he was more doctor than preacher. And I knew then I wanted to know more about that man, especially about the doctor part of it. I learned that he was a great benefactor to mankind. And I began to pray that I could encapsulate some of that energy. But I knew I had a competing force and I knew that I couldn't do it as long as I was drunk on being Picasso, Ma Michelangelo, and, <laughs> and Da Vinci. So I prayed, I said, God, if you can remove that demon of art from me, I'll serve you. And God removed it for 23 years. God can do anything, y'all know that? He can even remove these demons. Now I can still do it. I can do it just as good as I ever done it. But I don't have that motivation anymore because I have a greater motivation that is to please Jesus. Amen. The right hand is used to open doors through which the body may find entrance. Now all of us came in this building and we drove our car by the use of our hands. It is the helping hand of the body. God's church has some helping hands. The helping hands of the church is medical missionary work. It is to help the body to go out and do the work for God. It is to help the ministers and elders to be able to go into community and to reach the unreachable. It is to remove the obstacles so that the body of Christ can go in and do him service. It is the medical missionary work. So the right hand, right hand is the medical work. The door is a barrier that has enclosed God's people. And they're shackled inside of the church wanting to go out and do service. It needs the help of the helping hand. This is the part the medical missionary work is to act. The medical missionary work is to act the part to open the door, to remove the barrier, so the church can go out and work for God. Too long have the church been closed in. Too long have we been strategized in trying to figure out how we can reach this community. God has given us a work that no other church has. It is the medical missionary work. It is the life of Christ being manifested and illustrated in love. And it will enable us to reach this community. But we will never reach this community as long as we're competing against those demons of this world. Those demons has offered them more than we can give them. Those demons are offering them a repass from their pain, their anxiety, their stress. Only to be returned later with even a greater burden. But God can remove them forever. But he needs the medical work in order to reach them so that the medical work can bring them to the gospel. That's how we help each other. Neither can do the work without the other. The gospel cannot do the work without the medical work and the medical work cannot do the gospel without the gospel work. We need each other. It is largely to prepare the way for the reception of truth this time. In other words, there are a lot of truth in this world. Noah preached a great truth. And many of them. Moses had a fantastic truth. Jeremiah had a dynamic truth. But the truth that we need today is present truth. To prepare a people for the present crisis. Amen. God's people are ill prepared for the crisis we are facing. COVID is testing the strength of God's people. And we are now depending upon the medical people to come up with some type of solution so that we can live a normal life. It shows just how incapable we are to stand in the day of a crisis. Uh, what are we going to do when we had to cross the Jordan? I tremble when I see what we are faced with. The church has been totally uh, annihilated. Church is not as strong as it used to be. 
people long to come and associate in church. Now, they are very pleased to stay home and look at the internet or Zoom or Facebook for church. The electronic church have removed the assembly of God's people together and God said, do not forsake to join yourself together as you see the day approaching. No electronic church will ever replace the living preacher. Amen. It would never happen, but I see it's happening and it has lured God's people into a system of comfort by which they would rather stay home in their pajamas and go to church than to come and assemble with God's people. People, we are in desperate times. This is why it is important that we use the medical work to prepare the way for the reception of truth for this time. A body or a church without hands is what? Useless. useless. A church without medical mission or work is useless. Oh, it can say a lot of good things. He said, Lord, Lord, I did that. And Lord, Lord, we're going to do that. And God said, I don't know you. Amen. You see, you're not the only one talking about Jesus Christ. All of them are talking about some God. We got to illustrate his life. That life of Christ that we are talking about, we're praising about, we must become that life. We must become Christ. Amen. And the only way that this sister was talking about perfection this morning, the only way we can do that, we must be perfect. Now, you said that man going to go into fanaticism. Bear with me just a moment. No, you cannot be perfect of yourself. You cannot do it. You cannot keep the law. It's impossible. But why would God ask me to keep a law when he knows good well I can't keep it? So that we can see how incapable we are in keeping the law and we can see some other avenue by which we can keep it. God has given us something to keep. And that's his son. He kept the law. All we need to do is keep him. And so me and Christ can come before the Father as being perfect, even the perfection of Jesus Christ, because he was able to defeat sin in the flesh and show me that I can do it. So when the Father look at me, he don't see me. He see me in the cliff of a rock. You remember Moses. When he wanted to see God, and God said, I'm going to give you a little glimpse of me. Just a little glimpse. Well, a little glimpse would have totally annihilated him. Except he put him in a rock. That rock was Christ. Don't you ever think it had something to do about rocks and dirt? That rock was Christ. Christ shell sheltered him from the visible presence of Christ, a God. And God is saying to us, if Christ is in us, then we can stand before the Father. And the Father will see Christ's righteousness in us. Because me and Christ have become what? One creature. A body without hands is useless. And giving honor to the body, we must also give honor to the helping hands. It's time. It's a great thing to give honor to the church. And God knows we need to do it. We need to come to church more today than ever before. Amen. But there is a time we got to give honor to the medical missionary work. Honor must also be given to the helping hands, which are agents of such importance that without them the body can do nothing. Therefore, a body which treats indifferently the right hand, refusing its aid, is able to accomplish nothing. God has given us a wonderful work. The world cannot duplicate it. They can come up with everything. But God has given us a beautiful system to work with. He himself is the miracle of the ages, a man having the same flesh and blood as we have, and yet living above the dominion of sin. He did that in human flesh and human nature to show that we can do it in human flesh and human nature and that we can have the divine mind that he had. All oh, don't put his mind down to our level. No way. But he elevate us to take on his mind. So his mind can what? Make that flesh be in submission to the very divine inclinations of the mind. What a wonderful process he has given us as a people. He entered the world in a supernatural manner. He did a supernatural work was wrought through him and we can do it also. And he surrendered his life in a supernatural manner. When God called you 
not just our dear pastor, our dear elder, but every member of the church, God called them. Because we have come to a time when every member of the church should be a medical missionary. Amen. We at that time. And yet he made himself just as dependent upon the power of his father as we are dependent upon him. So when we get into those real dark moments where we don't know what to do and we don't have any solutions, remember the same power that Jesus had, we have it. The same miracles that he gave to Christ, he gave it to us. He's no respect to person. If anything, he gave us more than he gave Christ. He gave us Christ. And you can't get no more than that. Hear him say, I can of myself do nothing. He couldn't. Because he emptied himself of all his divine power. And equaled himself to us. <laughs> he limited. He, he couldn't work a miracle to save himself. He refused to do that. The only thing he had, Father, help me. I can do nothing of myself. Remembering the night of prayer. When he sought to obtain a sustaining grace. Remember those moments, Mother, when you prayed for that wayward son or daughter. Remember the agonizing tears that fell from your cheek. It is the same avenue by which Christ prayed in the garden. And the same prayer, the same answer to the prayer is available to us today. Follow him through the Gospel of John. Now he changes the water into wine. Now he healed the noble man's son without visiting his home. So intercessory prayer works. You, you understand what I'm talking about? Praying for each other. When somebody said, pray, pray for someone, you don't have to go there and lay hands on them. You don't have to do it. As long as you had a faith. Now he restores the health of man at the pool of Bethesda. Now he feeds the multitude with the five barley loaves and two fish which he blessed. Now he walked upon the sea to go to the relief of the distressed disciples. Now he gives sight to the man who was born blind. You know, I think about the man that was born blind. You know, they had, they had been advertising that a great healer is going to come to their town. And everybody was excited about it because it had been rumored that People were being healed and raised and can you imagine the excitement? It was greater than Benny Hinn or anybody else. And so finally, the day came. And all the nobles and all the rich and the poor and they all flocked to the hillside to hear the great man that would expound it on them and work these great miracles. Christ always tarry. Do y'all understand that? He ain't anxious about nothing. He take his time. Sometimes he tarry because he's simply testing out those that come for the fish and the loaves. You know, some just come for the excitement. Some just come because I just want to get a meal. I just want to hear some good music and nothing else. Now don't pay no attention to this thing in my nose. I'm not trying to be fashionable. This is some charcoal filters I have in my nose. It protects me 100% from the COVID virus. I work with a lot of COVID patients. I have over 500 COVID patients. So I have to protect myself real well. Uh, and so I can wear this and I don't have to worry about a mask. You can have it too. Contact me, I'll make sure you get some. Anyway, uh, they've been waiting all day long. And finally Christ came on the scene. And when he came on the scene, everybody said, finally, he show up. And he walks out, simple looking man. He kneeled down on the ground, spit in the dirt, take his finger, began to play in the spit in the dirt. Now, what do you think these educated teachers and philosophers and professors and educators, what do you think they're going to think? Man, I have wasted my time. Coming out here seeing an idiot playing in the dirt in the spit like a child. 
I could have went to some sport arena. I could have went to a party. But I come out here and see this man wasting my time. People, keep your eyes on Jesus. He can take the simple thing and baffle the wisdom of this world. He lift the spit and the clay off the ground and laid it on the man's eye as a plaster or poultice. Then he told the man to go and wash in the pool. And as the man began to fumble through, still blind, trying to find the pool to wash himself, others began to look at him and said, he couldn't heal him. He's just trying to stall for time. He couldn't do it. The devil came to him and said, man, go home and wash your face. That man couldn't heal you. You're making a fool out of yourself. But he said, I've come this far by faith. I'm going to walk this thing to the end. He came to the pool and he washed and he received his sight. You would think it would be over with. But his neighbors that knew him began to question and said, Is that not him that was born blind? It looked like him. It talked like him. It's not him. It can't be. And his faith was tested. And so Christ was able to do with spittle and clay what all the pharmaceuticals could not do. God is glorified through simplicity. And God is looking for simple people that would use simple means that he may be what? Glorified. And finally, he restored the life of Lazarus, who had been dead four days. And these signs and records that recorded that we might believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God. And that by so believing, we might have life in his name. But while exhibiting these convincing proofs of his deity, it is equal clear from the same records that he was a man among men. That means that after he did all these mighty miracles, he was a man that did that. And God did that so we can do the same thing. Because now you're going to say, well, we can't do nothing because the only person can do that but Christ. No, he did it as a man. He laid aside his deity and did it the same way each and every one of us can do it. No, we don't have to be afraid of COVID or cancer or nothing like that. I've worked with so many cases, you wouldn't believe it. I could blow you away this evening and show you things that you wouldn't even believe. I won't do it. But believe me, they exist. And I guess it's because I had no connection with Christ. It may have been my greatest blessing. It may have been my greatest blessing because when I found Christ, it was my greatest possession. Amen. You see what I mean? I cherished it. Mm -hmm. I had never experienced anything like that. It is equally clear from the same record that he was a man among men in all things made like and unto what? Us. He did it and by God's grace I'm going to do it and you can do it. Don't sit back and say, I don't know how they do that. You can do it. I tell people that diabetes is the easiest disease in the world to reverse, especially type 2. People come to my clinic, I say, you know, you don't have to give me a dime if I don't help you with type 2 diabetes. If you don't walk out of here free of diabetes, you don't owe me nothing. I'm almost at that point with COVID. I could help your mother by the grace of God and your mother do not have to sleep. She can recover from it. All you need to do is just call my office, tell them that get the kit to you right away. If she's on a ventilator, that's going to be tough. But if you can get off the ventilator and get it into her, you'll be amazed to see how she could bounce back from that. And we, we have de developed uh, herbal tonics for people that have pneumonia, they have blood clots in the lungs. Uh, it, it's just amazing what God can do. It really is. It's no sense. Ellen White said there's healing properties in the pine, the fir, and the cedar tree. And she said there are other like trees out there that have medicine properties. God's people have not investigated these simple uh, vital nutrients in these plants. We read about it, but we don't act on it. How many of you had a cold, a pneumonia, a new someone, and there's a pine tree, a cedar tree, right out in the yard. And you don't know what to do. 
You follow what I'm saying? Go out there and cut the limbs, the needles, and boil them for about 15 minutes. Take about one pound of pine needles and boil it for about 15 minutes, extracting the natural quinine in it. Because the coronavirus is a parasite. Quinine would disarm the parasite. And put a little sweetener in it and a little horseradish in it, a little garlic, and a little vitamin C, and a little zinc in it, and drink it. Make a beverage out of it. I'm going to give you a formula, that, a complete formula to deal with it. God's people have no business being worried about corona, but they got to do something. You got to do something. You can't not sit back Amen. and think, well, it ain't going to happen to me because I'm a seven-day Adventist. Are you for real? <laughs> I worked in New York City. When it hit New York City, they called me and asked me, could I help them? And they was dying up there. You know, in big time. I'm talking about our people was dying. We can do things about it. No, we shouldn't be afraid of it. But we're going to have to do something. It is this Jesus of the scriptures who is the reality of the reality of Christianity. He who is the divine one assumed our human, human nature in order that we who are of sin, sinful may be, may be partakers of the divine nature. So it's a divine exchange. His is the way essential of Christianity and involved personal union with Christ through the indwelling of the Spirit. But the risen, exalted, and glorified Christ now represent us in the courts of heaven and revealing himself to us as a present savior and the historical Jesus who walked among men. He's the same one. The one that's in heaven in the heavenly courts is the historical Jesus that's walking in the heavenly courts in the sanctuary above, veiling his divinity and humanity. The only way he could do it. You want to know, well, why did he veil his humanity uh, in divinity? Well, you remember when Moses had saw that glory and he was lit up like a lightning bulb? And he come down to give the people the word of God and they were so afraid and they ran and they hid themselves because they couldn't stand, stand before the brightness. That brightness was the holy Shekinah glory. That was the righteousness of the Father. Well, he couldn't do it. He said, Lord, I can't teach the people nothing. They're afraid. God said, veil that glory. Are you with me? He said, put a veil over that glory. That veil was humanity veiling divinity. That's what it symbolized. It symbolized that God veiled his glory. And Jesus Christ is the glory of the Father. Veiled him in humanity that he could stand before us and talk to us as a man. That's what it symbolized. Veiling his divinity and humanity. And it is just this Jesus of history who must become the Christ of our experience. We must see Christ in his humanity. Veiling his divinity. So that we can duplicate and be the same. When people see that, then we can accomplish the work Christ has asked us to do. He made known the love which take no account of self. When you're ministering to people, I know I'm doing a training school right now. I've been working ever since January, nonstop. I left Barbados. No, I left Barbados. I went to El me and my son went to El uh, Honduras. We from Honduras, we barely got out of Honduras and got in here. And we have not stopped doing training schools. And we're in a training school right now, training medical missionary physicians. And uh, I did not. I, last week, I mean, my son was in Alabama and we was doing a training school. And after it was over with, I told my son, I said, son, I said, I'm so glad. I'm so glad it's over with. We're going to go home and rest the week. I get home, take my shoes off, get in the bed, open my computer up, and my dear brother Kalen said, Brother Wilson, we're looking forward to seeing you. Make sure you bring some books. <laughs> my son, I know what I'm talking about. I said, oh, no. <laughs> I thought we had one week, 
He said, no. I said, Lord, okay, you able, but I'm not. <laughs> so, uh, by God's grace, I'm here. I'm here. And next week, a week after next, I'll be in Lake Tahoe. And uh, don't feel like doing that either. But I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm going to work myself to death. Are you following me? In other words, I'm going to work this carnal nature right out of me. Amen. I'm going to be so busy working with God, it's going to die. <laughs> so, I hope you understand that. And the power was delivered from the fierce assault of the enemy. And all this was done, not for himself, but for our benefit. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, who knew no sin, made to be sin on our benefit, behalf, that he might become, or uh, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So he did all this so we can become like Christ. Amen. All of it. And we can do it. I long for the day when God's people see that. All through this country, a work must be done that has not yet been done. The medical missionary work must be what? Recognize. It's time. It's time. I mean, it's, it's, it's going. Because she said that the last work will be carported ministry and medical missionary work. Can't you see it? Yes. Now that don't mean that the gospel won't be important. It is important. But things are going to happen that is going to inhibit us from preaching the gospel, pre se. But we can live the life of Christ being manifested in medical missionary work. And then the people will come to you and ask you, what kind of God y'all serve? Y'all different. That's when you present the gospel. Amen. Those who go forth engaged in the work of ministry must be intelligent upon, on the subject of health reform. They got to be. If you're going to be a preacher, you got to be a doctor. If you're going to be a doctor, you got to be a preacher. You cannot separate it. Those men who after many years of experience have yet no appreciation for medical missionary work should not be appointed to preside over our churches. Do y'all understand these principles? Why is God so excited about, about you got to involve medical mission work because the world is a laser house of sickness and disease. You're not going to reach this community by preaching. You can't compete with them folks down the street. Those pastors can turn flips and bring any abomination in the church. Anything that would entertain the people. Violating every biblical principle to bring people in. Having all kind of dinners that is an abomination. Bringing all that stuff in the house of God. They can do it. You can't do it. You are handicapped. And to ask the pastor to compete against that is not fair. But God has given us a magic weapon and it's called medical mission at work. They can't do that. And when you combine the gospel with the health, boy, it's a two-fold cord that cannot be broken. Amen. They are not walking in the light of present truth for this time if you reject medical mission at work. Those who love the truth and appreciate the question of temperance and all his blessing should not be placed in charge of a minister who has not heeded the light God has given upon health reform. What help can a man be to a church if he's not walking in the light? Are you following that? Can't be much of a help. Medical missionary evangelists will be able to do excellent pioneer work. The work of a minister should be blended fully with that of a medical missionary evangelist. Christian physicians should regard his work as exalted as that of a minister. He bears a double responsibility, for in him is combined the qualification of both a physician and a gospel minister. His is a grand and sacred and necessary, very necessary work. That's the missing thing that we're missing. And it's my burden to share that with you and every church I go in. And I'm not sharing this as a reproof. I'm sharing this as a helping hand. 
I would like to come back here when the day appointed and do a training school. And I would like to train the church how to work this community Amen. with the pastor and the elders, with their blessing. So that when you go out to meet the people, you go with a medical missionary and you go with an elder or pastor, a Bible worker. Amen. Now you're going to see a difference. You don't go in there with them big Bibles and whole suitcases of uh, Spirit of Prophecy books. You don't do that. You have a little old Bible, you stick it in your pocket, and you got a bucket and a towel. And you knock on that door and you say, God told me some sickness in this house, and I believe it is, and it sure is. We got arthritis, we got this. By God's grace, God told me to come here and help you. Are you following me? Yes. You know what that's going to do? You help them people, you help that whole community. Because they're going to tell everybody about it. That's how you do it. It's just like helping that horse. No difference. No difference. Well, I, when you were telling me, talking about that horse, I thought about my horse story. We had an old horse. He was a, a a walking horse. He break out the crib. I mean, out the pass and get in the crib and get in the corn all the time. He went to the corn crib and he ate a lot of corn. He got founded. Now, you horse people know what I'm talking about. That horn that. That corn would swell up in him and constipate him. And he's dying. Went to the vet and asked the vet what to do. He said, boys, if you don't get it out of him, he's going to go blind. His feet going to swell up and he's going to die. I said, okay. He said, well, what do we do? He said, you got to give him an enema. I said, a horse, an enema? <laughs> he said, you got to do it. He told us what to do. We went and got a three-gallon uh, Coke bottle, fill it up with olive oil, hooked a water hose to it, and I ran that down his nose into his belly and held it up. And we filled his belly up with olive oil. And then one of the brothers put a bit in his, in his mouth and twisted it, because I had to take my hand and stick it up in his rectum and clean him out. And I tell you what, that was one of the most fearful jobs I ever had. <laughs> I'm looking at them big legs and all the muscles and I'm there pulling it out and he's shaking and going on and I knew he could kick me at any moment but I was able to clean him out and that saved the horse. Amen. So I worked on a few animals too. <laughs> <laughs> um, God is good. Ministers as medical missionaries. Ministers will often be called upon to act a part of physician. He should have a training that will enable him to minister the simple remedies for the relief of the suffering. Ministers and Bible workers should prepare themselves for this line of work, for in doing it, they are following the examples of Christ. That's why we're struggling. See, we expecting the pastors, the elder, to do the work, and then we come to church and get entertained. And he works all week long to come up with a good sermon so he can entertain you. And he go home and and the church just continues the same old rut. The sermon is to motivate us to get up and go to work. Amen. And do likewise. Amen. That's all it is. It's just a pep rally. Get you out of here. I don't know. I don't know what it's going to take. But it's going to take. It's going to take. An experience that Saul went through. Acts the ninth chapter. And Saul yet breathing out, threatening and slaughtering against the disciples of the Lord, he went into the high priest. Now this man had a lot of zeal and a lot of love for the church. Desiring of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogue, that if he found any in this way, whether they were men or women, that he may bring them bound to Jerusalem. He was fixed on trying to please the church. It was a dust set of church instead of dust set God. And he really thought he was doing God a service. He was not a hypocrite. He was serious about trying to please God by pleasing the demands and the dictate of the church. Do y'all understand that? Yes. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there signed around him a light from heaven. Now that's that holy kind of glory again. That is the visible presence of God that was reflected off of Jesus Christ. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecute thou me? That's the same light 
that they experienced at the Mount of Transfiguration. That is the same light that Adam and Eve had before the sin. They were clothed with a light of garment. And he experienced in that same light. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard to kick against the prey. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou should do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice and seeing no man. And Ananias went, went his way and entered into the house, putting his hand on him, saying, now let me back up a little bit. Ananias was intimidated over Paul. And he's telling God, I, I hear to this man. I hear what he's done to the church. And are you sure you asking me to go help this man? Are you following me? And he was convinced that he was a special servant called of God. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way that thou camest, has sent me that thou may receive sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. You see, Paul was already a member of the church. But his spirit was not. And so... He already had a lot of knowledge, but he's been to, about to be baptized into the remnant church, the church that's standing in the light. And so in order to put the seal of acceptance, Paul had to go to the church. And Ananias was the pastor that ministered to him. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it was scales, and he received his sight. You see, Paul looked at that bright light too long. And that bright light caused his eyes to stop dilating. And he developed cataracts. You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever looked at a bright light and then you turn away and you're kind of, kind of blind. You can't really see. Your eyes stop dilating. It's just set still. You're staring in the light. Because when you dilate, you're doing this. You're focusing. But if you look too long, your eyes don't focus and the eye dry out. And then your brain says, hey, this person going to destroy his retina. You better do something. And the brain said, OK, let's do something. It sends a nervous impulse and said, speed up the cells on the eyes. And the cells start packing up and packing up to build a scab called cratarac. As a protective membrane that stopped the ultraviolet rays from destroying the what? Retina. Hey, Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. You take them nice soft hands and you go picking up rocks all day long. You say, where in the world those calluses come from? The brain said, if you don't hear him do something, he going to rub a hole in his hand. So the brain sent messages to the skin cells said, stop piling up on each other and make him a cushion so that he won't rub a hole in his hand. God has already fixed. The healing and the protection is already in us. If we would obey God, there would be no sickness among us. Amen. It wouldn't happen. But because we have transgressed, we're born in sin and shaped in iniquity, we're born with infirmities. Oftentimes, Jesus ran across different people with problems. In Matthew's the 20th chapter, and it came to pass as he was come nigh into Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the way begging. And he heard the multitudes pass by, and he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passed by. And he cried out and said, Jesus, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy. Jesus cannot refuse a cry like that. Now you mothers, have you ever cried and asked, cried out and asked God to save your children? And them little knuckleheads get worse and worse. And they get worse. They don't get better, they get worse. And he said, God, I promise that you saved my children. You think God's going to renege on that? Mm -mm. If you obedient, he'll save your children. He didn't say if they be obedient. He said, if you obey, I'll save your children. Do you get it? Amen. The hindrance 
that's hindering us from our children being saved is us living an inconsistent life to the gospel Amen. they live with you they see you they see you flaring off at your wife and they hear you hollering at them they see all this inconsistent that don't parallel with the life of Christ and they lose respect for your life and you expect them to come and he said look you obey you learn to obey that temple you got you start eating right you start going to church and being consistent you treat your wife at home the same way you treat at church Amen. and I save your children Does that make sense yes. please look at it like that because that's the only thing that's going to make a difference now when he saved them let him save them in his own way uh, please let me tell this story before I stop dear friend of mine and I tell it all the time dear friend of mine and his wife beautiful Christian people he had one problem he had a demon a passion he had a woman on that side of town had his wife on this side of town and this is a true story and his wife said we just go and visit her and we said uh, sis you know he got another woman she says I know it but I love him I said wow and I'm praying to God to give my husband back. She prayed. Months went by. Years went by. Finally, he got diabetes. They cut off one of his hand. Eh? Then the other hand. Then they cut off a leg. And that woman, that other woman, said, I don't want a half of a man. She loaded him up, put him in a wheelchair, brought him to his first wife parked him out in the front yard blowed the horn his wife looked out there and seen it she come out and rolled him in the house she is happy as she can be so when we met her again she said brother Wilson brother Solomon brother Wilson guess what I said what God has answered my prayer there's no greater love than that so let God save your children his way Amen. They may come back being a quadriplegic. They may come back totally dependent on you. That's all right. Just get them back. As long as they got breath in their body. Yeah. Sometimes the best students is a captive audience. Men and women in prison. They can't run nowhere. They will hear the word of the Lord. Maybe that child will have to be put in a circumstance where he can't run from God. If you be faithful, God will save your children. Amen. And so that man cried out, Jesus, Jesus, have mercy. And Christ is having mercy on us today. And he's hearing your prayer. Just cry out to him. Pour your heart out to him. As this man here cried out to God. And God wants us to be able to see. Just taking a little lemon, cutting it in half, and squeezing a few drops in a person's eye. The lemon is going to sting. It's going to sting. But it's going to cause your eyes to dilate. That lemon is high in citric acids which break down fat deposits that have blocked the little duct that release fluid to bathe your eyes. It emulsify that fat. You've seen the commercial with OxyClean. They have a platter that's got a lot of grease on it and they stick it down in the dish water and half of it come up clean. And you wonder, how did that do that? It's the citric acids that breaks down the fat globians. It's the same citric acid in that lemon when you squeeze it in your eye, it emulsifies the fat that has blocked the little capillaries that is preventing tear duct from bathing your eyes. The healing property is in the tear duct. It's not in the lemon, it is in the tear duct. Once the tear duct is set free to bathe the eye and moisture the eye, it will dissolve the cataract. Do that. One drop of lemon juice in the morning, one drop of honey at night. If you have glaucoma, 
simply remedy for glaucoma is to take one teaspoon of salt take one ounce of vegetable glycerin take about four ounces of spring water about four ounces of spring water mix it together put about two drops in your eyes in the morning two drops two or three drops in your eyes in the evening it burns it stains but you learn obedience from the things which you suffer Amen. you following me Amen. by the sadness of the countenance is the heart made better sometimes crying can be a blessing those tears would do what nothing else would be able to do it's all through God has remedies throughout the day I'm going to really get into some remedies but as I get ready to close I just want to introduce to you because we're going to look at a lot of remedies today how we can deal with these problems we're going to look at how we can deal with some of the most impossible conditions they are possible yeah, they are possible you know uh, as I began I said I wanted to be Michelangelo da Vinci and Picasso I found out there was a man named Jeffro Claus and I said I want to be like him <laughs> that's a better deal you know what I mean Amen. that's a better deal to be like him and because I saw in him Jesus Christ if a child have a fever sponge him down with vinegar cool vinegar give him an enema every 10 minutes until the fever normalize take hot water before eating half a quart or more or less it will never do any harm but rather be productive of good a cup of tea made from catnip herbs will quieten the nerve hops tea will induce sleep all these remedies are Ellen White gave us these remedies through God's messenger these are simple remedies we don't even know them you know the reason why we don't know them we don't read we don't read the books that God has given us that have really been a tremendous blessing to us she said if the eyes are weak if there's pain in the eyes or inflammation a soft flannel cloth wet in hot water and salt will bring relief quickly I've seen people have inflammatory eyes I mean eyes just red beet red I tell them to take six teaspoons of salt put it in 10 ounces of water and bathe your eyes continuously with it before you can use the 10 ounces of water it'll clear up the redness in your eyes I tell them take an egg and crack it take the white of an egg and smear it on a piece of napkin lay that on your eyes and it'll pull the redness out of the eye these things are available to us and we don't know them and God wants us to know it so we can show it to the world and I'm just dealing with some very simple things here but it's not just the aluminum utensils it's the aluminum in toiletries deodorants aerosol we inundate ourselves with aluminum that's why we have so many major problems with Alzheimer's right now because aluminum is not biodegradable once it get into the bloodstream it can destroy some of the brain cells and so but these things we got to be re-educated you know and this is why the medical work and the gospel must work together there's so much we need to know about the gospel because we have hindered the medical work from opening up our minds so we can understand these truths from a different perspective.